All right, everyone. So as an example, as, as a goal to aspire to in this class, you can actually check out one version of what we're going to end up in this class with. So go to your web browser and go to this address, vmcampus.com slash sdce. Now, go to it on your mobile device. If you have a mobile device, go to it on your mobile device. If you don't, just go to it on your web browser as normal. But if you have an iPhone, an Android phone, whatever, go to that address. It's a website. Go to that address on your mobile device. If you don't have the mobile, just open the web browser and go to it. vmcampus.com slash sdce. If you go to this uh, web app, uh, on the desktop, you'll get a pop-up that you will not see if you go to it on the mobile device. This pop-up is basically telling you very ham-fistedly that it detected that you're on a desktop computer or a laptop. And it says, visit us next time on your mobile device. Some other data. If you go to that address on your mobile device, you will not see that. And it will go directly to something that looks like this. If you go to that address on your mobile device, I'm sorry, on your desktop, it'll look like this. So if you go to the address on a desktop or laptop computer, you will see the desktop version of the website. This is just a fake screenshot, it doesn't do anything. But if you click at the bottom, mobile site, then you can see the mobile site. Notice if you go to it on the mobile device, it goes directly to the mobile to the mobile optimized version of the of the site. So this is what we're going to strive for this month. This is what we are going to develop. It's a website, but next month, then we're going to take this core code and convert it into an Android app. So that's the state of things nowadays, that you can actually take a, a website and convert it into an Android app, or an iPhone app, or a Windows Phone app. So this is what we're going to create this first month. Take a moment to browse the, the site. It's, it's live. It's real. Uh, if, you, if you click on the Art button, you should see a little animation that happens. It goes to the Art screen. You can go to Computers. So you can transition from screen to screen. You have, uh, for example, in the art screen, these classes, these fake classes. I don't think they're offered at, the, at this college for real. But you can click and they open up and, uh, and it has content. In the computer's screen, you can look at the content in a different way. You've got these classes. I want to learn these basic computer classes. Click there. Little animation slides over. Content. Go back. Click on that one. More content. Go back. Back to the home screen. There's a uh, little info button. If you tap that, You'll get a pop-up screen with some content, some pictures, whatever. And then here's the coolest part on the mobile device. If you go to directions, your mobile device should ask you, would you like to share your location? I'm going to say yes. So it's going to tap into the GPS of my device and give me a map from here to that college, which is also here. So it'll be a U-turn. But on the desktop, if I click there, depending on your web browser, it might pop up to say, allow it to check your location. 
I'm going to say allow. If you don't see that, don't worry. Now, this worked on my mobile. It showed me here I am. Well, it's a little bit off because the interference of this building. But it's a real map. I can tap it and drag it. I can pinch and zoom. I can even do Google Street View. It's a real map. On the desktop, it tells me I'm in downtown San Diego. <clears throat> well, this is not really meant to be looked at on a desktop computer with no GPS capabilities. It's meant to be looked at on a mobile device with GPS capabilities. So it defaulted to downtown San Diego. If you select Get Directions on either your mobile or your desktop, you will get turn-by-turn -turn directions that tell you how to get here. Question. Um, sometimes I see that happening with this web version, but trust me, it will work when we go through the whole process. Question. Oh, okay. Uh, what what version of the iPhone do you have? Oh, I iPhone. Well, that's not too old. Um, it might be a variety of issues. Again, this is when we get into the wonderful world of app development, where now we have to deal with so many devices. So the great thing about Android is because it's open source, every manufacturer can change it as their as as their will. The bad thing about Android is that every manufacturer can change it to their will. So the Samsung version of Android is a little bit different from the LG version of Android, from the Motorola version of Android, etc. So there's going to be quirks. We try to address them all as best as possible, but there's always going to be these issues. So on my Windows phone here, it seems to be working as I intended it. How many of you is this working great on your Android? Okay, how many of you is this working great on your iPhone? So some of you yes, some of you no. There's a variety of factors in play. And remember, ultimately, this is step one, create the web app. Step two is turn it into the actual app, which will work a lot better because it'll tap directly into the capabilities of the device. So right here, it may not work exactly as intended, but trust me, it will. All of the people from last semester can back me up. So. This map is real, and I can zoom in, and it gave me directions. It's not going to speak to me and tell me turn left and turn right and all of that. But it will give me turn-by-turn -turn directions on my mobile device, a live map. I can zoom in, etc. Question? Um, we're going to target between version 2.2 and 4.3, so a wide range of Android devices. And that range is even what the range that Google themselves target. If you've got an, an Android 2.1 device, they tell you basically upgrade. So we're going to target a large demographic. We can't target every demographic, unfortunately, because these things change every year. And if you know any about the history, Android devices and iPhone devices, iPhone came out in 2007, um, Android came out I think in 2008, yeah, that's six, seven years ago. To really target Android 1.0, you know, that's uh, stretching things, but we'll be able to target 2.2 and up. Alright, so this app this web app, this is what we're going to be striving for. It's all HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You're free to look at the code if you know how to do that. But what we're going to do is we're going to code this app basically from scratch, this website. It's going to be a website in the beginning and eventually an app, a full-featured app. It doesn't do all the capabilities that the app does. That's why I ask, check out, download the example because you'll see the features that this does not have, such as being able to save a list of classes you're going to take or have taken. It's going to save 
data persistently to the app. So you can make a list of apps of classes you've taken, check them when you've done them, etc., and they'll get saved to the app. And then on the next level of that is to save that app, synchronize that app data to the cloud. So there's a lot we can do. So before we can run, we need to learn how to walk, and perhaps some of us need to learn how to crawl. So the first day, and probably much of the next day, we're going to be, I'm going to be doing this class lesson uh, from zero. If you've never had any experience in HTML, if you've had experience in HTML, it might be a repeat of what you've already done, but it's always good to brush up on the basics. And then definitely week two, we're going to go from zero to 60 a lot faster. But this first week is for people that don't have any experience or are rusty in hand coding HTML. So what I recommend as the code editing tool in this class is this free software called Notepad++. You can download it for free for Windows, and I'll talk about a Mac version in a moment. The software is already installed on these computers, but if you don't have it at home, you can get Notepad++. If you're used to Visual Basic, or Eclipse, or Sublime Text, or any text, any code editing tool that you're used to, go ahead and use it. In this class, we're going to use Notepad++. It's a free download. It's like 3 megabytes. Eclipse is what? 100? Visual Studio is what? 1,000? So this tiny, simple app, Notepad++, for Windows. On the Mac, one that I recommend is Text Wrangler. It's another free app. It's a text editor for the Mac. So for uh, Windows, I recommend Notepad++. For the Mac, I recommend Text Wrangler. And if you're on Linux, you know what you're doing. So in these computers, we've already got Text Wrangler. Let's go ahead and load it up. Go to the Start menu. Go to the Start menu and type Notepad. Plus plus. So you're going to search for, you're going to load Notepad. Plus plus. Now, these classes, notice I'm going to zoom in when necessary. I might underline stuff when necessary. If something uh, was hard to read or passed you up, raise your hand. I'll try to accommodate. If you need some help, raise your hand. I'll come over to help you out. Usually, at about every hour, we take a 10 minute break. And I would recommend, that would call me over at that time when you were really far behind. If you have like one step that you're behind or two, call me over at that moment. But if you're seven steps behind, call me over during the break. And usually I also do 20 or 30 minutes of open lab time at the end of every day. So if you're 20 steps behind, call me over then. But I try to be as accommodating as possible. Don't be afraid to raise your hand if you need any help. So let's load Notepad++. It'll probably pop up and tell you, uh, would you like to update? Just cancel that. And this is our editor. Let's go to File, Menu, New. Let's create a brand new empty document. And then we'll do save, file save as. Let's select save as. <clears throat> and I'm going to select to save this on the desktop. So if you have a flash drive, you can save it there if you want. Um, for the moment, save it to your desktop. What we're going to do today is not going to be mission critical. 
if you don't save it and, uh, and, and bring it back next time, that's okay. Uh, but I'm going to save this to the desktop, select the desktop, and then we're going to call this September 2nd. And then under Save As Type, make sure you select Hypertext Markup Language. So save this to the desktop, give it this name, doesn't matter. But what does matter, Save As Type Hypertext Markup Language. Question. How much HTML5 do we use for this versus HTML4? all HTML5s. We're going to do all HTML5 in this class. So we're going to use the most modern version of the language. All right, so hypertext markup language. Go ahead and click Save there. And now we have the best thing and the worst thing that a programmer can see. An empty screen. We can do anything we want here. To get to the point about that web app that I've shown you, which eventually becomes the Android app, there's a lot of steps. So um, it's all HTML5 based, our app. So at the very beginning, we have to start to define that our document is an HTML5 compliant document. So if you're used to web design from the past, you're used to creating a doc type, a document type, and saying this is HTML4 or 4.4 or XHTML or whatever. We're using the latest version of the code, HTML5. So we need to define a doc type. Uh, so if you're not used to HTML, HTML works with pairs of tags. It stands for HTML because that's hypertext markup language, markup language. Basically, we're going to say, think about this document here. This document, we have some bold stuff and some bullet points and some paragraphs, but this can be a website. We've, we can mark from here to here is the title, and it's bold and it's underlined. We've marked it. Over here, we've marked this is a bullet point. It's been marked. And we are saying that this is a type of a document, HTML5. So the first tag that we write here, and all of our tags are going to be enclosed in angle brackets, the less than and the greater than, which is shift comma and shift period. So you want to type less than and greater than, the angle brackets. So I might refer to them as less than, greater than. I might refer to them as angle brackets. I might say open bracket, close bracket, you know, as a, uh, as a shorthand. Because we're going to write tags over and over and over, and they're always going to be like this. These angle brackets and something in the middle. What goes in the middle here is the exclamation point, shift one, and then doc type. D-O-C-T-Y-P-E space HTML. So this very first line is what's necessary to define that what follows is an HTML5 compliant document. In the old days we would have to write something like doc type XHTML um, 1.1 en slash slash blah 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 blah. It was a long doc type. They've simplified it down to now it's simply HTML. Now it's HTML5. It's the newest standard because this code changes all the time. This year is actually the 25th anniversary of the web. This programming language that we're going to talk about, HTML, was invented in 1989 by Tim Berners-Lee, a student in a, uh, in a European university. And this year is 25 years from that time. 25 years of the web, of websites. Now the internet is older than that. 
from the 60s. But the internet and the web are two different things, which we'll get to later. But right now we're writing the latest version of the code. Press enter. And we're going to write this HTML tag. Again, I'm going to start using shorthand. I'm not going to say every single thing. I'm not going to say less than HTML greater than. I'm going to say we're going to write the HTML tag. And when I say that, that means the angle brackets. And as I said, we mark things. So from here to here is bold. The whole thing from here to here is HTML. So it needs a pair. Press enter a couple of times. And we'll write the HTML closing tag, which notice is a little different. It has a slash right there. Open tag, close tag. We're saying everything between these HTML tags is an HTML document. Don't forget that slash. What I like about Notepad++ and what any civilized text editor will show you is uh, color coding. Because if we were using any other text editor, it would just be a wall of black and white text. That's very hard to read and deal with and to edit. But something like Notepad++ or Sublime Text or um, Aptana or whatever, they should code uh, color code your code. So for example, if you click on the slash HTML, it should highlight to show you this is where that tag started. So when you have a thousand lines of code, you can find where did that code start. So try that. Click on the slash HTML and it should highlight in purple back to HTML with a little connector down to slash HTML. If it doesn't, you might have misspelled it. Where's my misspelling here? I'm missing the slash. So, um, HTML are in pairs 99% of the time, pairs, like shoes. So we start the HTML tag, we close the HTML tag with a slash. One of the 1% that does not have a pair is the very first thing we wrote, actually. There will not be a slash dot type. I guess you could put it, but it doesn't do anything. Um, so I'll, I'll make a note of them, which of them don't have a pair but assume that most of the tags have a pair. We'll go between these HTML tags and write everything within the web page in between. Now we've done a lot of hard work, but what have we not done yet? We haven't saved our work. If the power goes out, we'll lose everything. So uh, Notepad tells you you haven't saved anything. What's this thing? It's 1.44 megabytes of data. No, it's the save. Uh, it's the save icon, right? Isn't that interesting that we don't see floppies anymore nowadays, but we still use the floppy icon to save. Uh, so this is telling us you haven't saved yet. It's red, so you can click up there to save or Control S or File, Save. So go ahead and save your work, and you'll see it becomes blue. You saved. You should know that. Uh, but you want to save your work often. All right, so um, let's go between the tags. And notice uh, Notepad gives us line numbers. That's, again, another mark of a civilized text editor. If we were using Word, Microsoft Word, or plain old Notepad, we would not get line numbers. So when I say, let's go to line 12 and edit this bit of code, you know what I'm talking about. Let's go to line 3 and uh, press the tab key. And we're going to write some code in here. Now pressing that tab was actually completely optional. We can technically write a web page that is one long line that goes off the edge of the page and goes on and on and on. HTML will not care. And that's very hard to read. So we're breaking up our, our tags into their own lines and then I usually tab, I usually indent when it's a new element, but it's optional, but it's recommended. 
The next tag that we need is the head tag, and that one needs a pair. So you want to write the head tag, press enter a couple of times, and close the head tag, slash head. To make sure you wrote it right, again, you could click on your head tag and it should highlight the, the beginning and the ending. Press Enter onto line 6, and I will do the body tag. Body tags. Notice everything is lowercase. Everything has a pair, except for the doc type. And right now what we're doing is we're, write, we're writing HTML5 compliant code. HTML5 code is defined with the first line there, and everything lowercase. So if you've uh, done websites before where you had everything uppercase, and then your attributes lowercase or whatever, that's not HTML5 compliant, all lowercase. Let's go back to the head section, tab that. We'll see in a moment if you're not if you don't if you don't know what we're doing yet. We'll see well what, what happens in head and what happens in body. We'll see um, we'll see this rendered in a moment. But inside of the head tag, inside of the head block, I'm gonna write the title tag, and just to show you that you do not need to break them up into lines. I'm actually going to keep the title tags, which of course are a pair, but I'm going to keep them on one line. That's valid. Did you double tab there? I did actually. I, I gave it a tab. You know, we were we were in the head section, so I tabbed it to get to 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 see at a quick glance that we're in the head section. And then within this title tag pair, uh, let's write the name of this class, HTML5 Web Apps. That's fine. Now, even if we have years of practice in writing HTML, most of us cannot translate this in our minds. We need a translator to make it look like a web page. And what would that translator be called? Web browser. Web browser. So we need to see what our result of our work is. And the way our workflow will be in this <laughs> class is we write some code in Notepad, we save our work, always remember to save, and then we'll go up to the Run menu and select a web browser. I'm going to go with Firefox just because it's the first on the list. I don't want to move my hand all over the place. Carpal tunnel. So I'm just going to select the first web browser. You can choose Chrome if you want, Safari, etc. But I'm going to go with Firefox. So that's our process. We're going to write code, save our work, run, launch Firefox. Go ahead and launch Firefox. This will render your code. It will translate it. And the result... Wait a minute, I thought I wrote HTML5 web apps. Why is this blank? This part that we see here is the body of the web page. And what we wrote was not in the body, it was in the head. The head is the title up on the tab, HTML for my web apps. So everything that goes in the head section then will not be visible in the body. It's stuff outside of the body. Uh, it has a use and a relevance, but at the moment with our current knowledge we see that we've written the title of the document and it's visible up on the tab 
There's nothing in the body. So well, let's write something in the body. What we're going to do is write the classic first code that we see whenever we write anything in a language. So let's go to the body section. I'm going to tab that. And we're going to write hello world. Now that's the traditional proof of concept first bit of code that everyone writes. It's tradition since the 50s, maybe even earlier. But if you can get Hello World to, to work on your language, you're on the right track. So remember our process. We write some code. You remember to save. Make sure your disk is blue. Save your work. Run Launch Firefox. This is not WYSIWYG. It's not what you see is what you get. You have to write your code, save it, run it. You won't see the code dynamically change. We'll see that later. There we go. Raise your hand if you see Hello World in the body. Does anyone need any, any help at this point? Here's my code so far. Right? Here's a very basic web page, website. If you've never done this before, pat yourself on the back. You're a web designer, a web developer now. <laughs> you can tell. Yeah, I've coded websites. You can tell people honestly that. Obviously, there's much more that we need to do here. Um, now, there was a very good question, because um, you've had experience, I'm sure. Um, well, we've written this, and it showed up there. But if you're used to uh, writing code already, you might think, well, why didn't we mark this as a paragraph? Well, nowadays, because we're using HTML5 and we're using modern web browsers, they're smart enough to kind of get what you're trying to do. So what I wanted to do here was write some text, and I wanted it actually to be like, like my example of the syllabus, where it's big and bold and interesting looking. But I never told it that. I didn't mark it. So again, HTML, hypertext markup language, you mark content to behave a certain way or to look a certain way. We didn't mark it, but it still kind of understood what we were doing. What I wanted it was to be big and bold and important. So what we'll do now is we'll add the H1 tag. Let's go back to where you wrote hello world and type H1, the H and the number one. And I want to wrap hello world, I want to wrap the h1 tag around it. So start h1 here and close h1 here. Mark hello world as h1. I'm not going to tell you what h1 is. Run it, save it and run it, and you'll see what h1 does. So mark this as h1, save it and run it. So we're going to do this over and over. You, here's a few time savers for you. I'm telling you that when you save it, you can then go to Run, Launch Firefox. A time saver is a handy keyboard shortcut. Run, Control, Alt, Shift, X. All right? So if your hands are already on the keyboard, Control, Alt, Shift, X. And with practice, you can do it with one hand. Control, Alt, Shift, X. Another time saver is, well, 
If you've already got it loaded up in your web browser, just refresh your web browser. So in Firefox, there's a refresh button. Any way you do it, you need to make a change, save it, see the result. Remember to save. Hello World now is big and bold and important looking, like a headline. And that's what H1 is. Headline number one. Headline of importance number one. So if you look at the example of the syllabus again, this is the biggest and boldest thing, and then there are hierarchies. There are levels. H1, H2, H3. The higher the number, the lower the level of importance of the element. Let's um, add a new line after our hello world. So this is line 8. We'll write h2. Notice we can write the tags either before or after we write our, our content. This time I know I want to make a heading number 2. So I wrote it. Notice again, I could divide this up into lines. I could do this. I could put h2, divide it up like that, and inside of here write HTML5 web apps. This is also valid. I can write uh, tags uh, separated <coughs> into different lines or single lines. It's up to you. Usually what I do, personally, is if I only have one little bit of content, I keep it on one line. But if I was going to write a paragraph here, I would divide it up into <coughs> separate lines. And again, I tabbed right here. HTML doesn't care. The web browser doesn't care. You can keep tabbing as much as you want. I'll specifically tell you where it cares for your spaces. If you save and run that, we have our next bit of text. The size of it is smaller. It's still big and bold. Yes, it takes up more space because it's more text, but it is smaller. So if we're going to have uh, headings, like my syllabus, we have plain old text as well. That would be paragraph text. So next line, we'll create the paragraph tag. But the paragraph tag is only a P. P for paragraph. We'll see that there are tags when this was invented. In 1989, we'll see that there are examples where the tag is spelled out and makes sense. And we'll see that there are some tags where it's just a, an acronym or a, or a, small, uh, um, a small word, or a small, um, like a P. Question? Uh, like I mentioned that you like, uh, <coughs> both tags and, and tag at the same time. Good eye. Notice what I've been doing so far. I've been, I've been writing the opening tag, and then right away I write the closing tag. That's how I teach my classes. We could write the opening tag, write our paragraph, be on our way, and forget to close the closing tag. And sometimes it doesn't matter, and sometimes it breaks the whole program. So I teach my classes, whenever there's a pair of something, close the pair, and then fill in the details. Later on, we're going to look at something where we can add a link And if we forget to close that pair, the whole rest of the document will not work. What I mean is I forgot to close the quote here. We'll do that later, but I'm saying that everything that needs a pair, I recommend write the pair, and then fill in the details. Let's write a simple paragraph here. Uh, this class teaches us to write 
HTML5 web apps. Press enter. Fun. All right, so just type type a line, press enter, save it, uh, type a little more, save it, run it, see your results. All right, so type a little something here, save it, run it, and there's my result. I've got the Hello World H1, the HTML5 web apps H2, and then the paragraphs that I wrote. Wait a minute, I thought I pressed enter and put the fun below the right text here. Well, technically we did not make a new paragraph. Uh, we have one paragraph, start the paragraph, end the paragraph. And even if we press enter in between, it does not make a paragraph. So even if I press enter a few times, it will not make new paragraphs or, or lines. We didn't mark it as a new paragraph. So let's fix that. Uh, after the paragraph that is currently there. Let's add another paragraph. Paragraph pair. And that text of fun, I moved it to the second paragraph. All right, so my first paragraph is that long sentence. My second paragraph is just that word. Save it and run it. There we go. We moved fun to its own paragraph. And yes, technically, one word can be a paragraph. The P tag simply breaks up content, this paragraph, this paragraph, this paragraph. Whatever is inside of it can be anything, even one word, even one character, an exclamation point, for example. And notice that empty space that I, that I left up here, line 13, did not appear. Let me add a few here just to show you. I've added a bunch of enters there. They do not show up here. The enters are ignored. And notice we had h1, h2. We had a paragraph and another paragraph, but we didn't write p1, p2, p3. We don't write that. Paragraphs do not have a hierarchy. All paragraphs are the same. They're all p's. But with uh, headings, we need to mark. Is it a heading level 1, a heading level 2, all the way to heading level 6? Um, if, if you were to put heading one for the hello world. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to make, make another line of something as bold below the HTML5, would you call that H1 again? Could you have more than H1 H1s? You could have more than one H1, but the concept of it doesn't work. We can write whatever code we want, but notice again with this real-world example, really only one thing should be big and bold as the first heading. If something else is as big and bold as that, we get a, we get a conceptual disconnect, because why is that so big and bold down here? We can style things to look big and bold, but without having the meaning, because what we've done here is we've, we've added styling and meaning. Later on, we'll talk about adding styling so that it doesn't have the meaning. And this will make more sense when we get 
again, we have to crawl before we can walk, before we can run. Eventually, we're going to be crawling and running, which is the, the web app with the cool menu and the shadows and all of that. We need this basic stuff before we get to that advanced stuff. So here's what we've got so far. Let's um, let's add a little bit more. Notice we've been adding content and marking it up. We can add uh, this other bit of content, which which is a purely visual element. Uh, I want to draw a a dividing line below the word fun. Uh, so after the p tags. After line 16 on a brand new line 17, I'm going to make a horizontal rule, a line that divides the, the screen. And this is the HR tag, horizontal rule. Well, again, a lot of us, even if we have experience with code, a lot of us can't process what things look like in code. We have to render it. So remember, save it and run it. And what you should see then is a dividing line. So you don't have to have a slash HR? Exactly. This is one of the 1% that does not have a, a pair. We've said, here's a horizontal rule, the end. We don't do a starting and an ending. Well, the internet cops come, and they handcuff you, and they take you away. <laughs> Nothing happens. And remember, if you're ever curious about anything, try it. See what happens. I'm going to put a slash HR. What happens? Nothing. No errors pop up, but it's just the, that's the standard. That's the way it is. We don't need a pair. Now, if you're used to HTML4 or XHTML, you might think, doesn't that need to be like this? Yes, but this is HTML5, so it looks like this. So if you don't know what I meant, don't worry about it. This is the right way now. Basically, if you're used to non-HTML5, when there's a single tag, it, does, it did used to sort of have a terminating slash. We don't need it anymore as per the latest standard. So this is our horizontal rule. Let's write another paragraph. And we'll write um, instructor Victor. And there's the result. Okay, we've seen that. We've been adding text content. We've been marking it up a little bit. Uh, we're going to see that we, we want to create our basic structure with HTML. And then we want to give it style. We want to give it colors. We want to make it look nice with CSS, cascading style sheets. But for the moment, we're going to be setting up the basic structure, HTML. And then we'll go back and say, I want this red. I want this yellow. I want a drop shadow here. I want a red background. I want rounded corners. And we can do that with CSS. We're not there yet. I want to add a picture. So I want a picture of myself here. I've got a picture that we can use of me that we can put into your web page. So actually I want my picture above my name. So let's actually go back and give yourself a line before your paragraph here. I'm on line 18. If your numbers here don't line up like mine, don't worry. Just try to find where you've uh, written what I've written. And here we're going to write another one of the 1% of tags that does not have a pair. The image tag. 
the image tag is, okay, the angle brackets, of course, and then it's spelled I-M-G. It's not image like the real word image, it's just I-M-G. So again, some will be spelled out like body, and some will be short, like image. This one does not need a pair, but it needs parameters. It needs to say, what picture should I show here? We write the parameters inside of the tag. So put your cursor right after the G, between the, the G and the angle bracket, and add a space there. So make sure you're in the image tag. And here we need to say, this is the picture in reference. We'll type href, hypertext reference, which is the fancy way of saying, I'm sorry, not that, src, source. Here's the source of the picture. Equals quotation mark, which is shift apostrophe, which is next to the enter, quotation mark. Notice as soon as I opened the quotation mark, everything turned purple because I did not close the quotation mark. Close the quotation mark. Image, space, source, equals, quote, end quote. Don't forget that end quote because you see everything turns purple. It thinks everything that follows is an image, which makes no sense. You have to say, the image is within these quotes. So if we had a picture, we would just type its name here. Picture.jpg, for example. This won't work because we don't have a picture on the desktop. I've saved my work to the desktop, and there's no picture on the desktop called picture.jpg. Instead, we're going to borrow a picture of me that's on the internet. We can put a web address here. For example, http colon slash slash victor.com slash picture. Now, don't type that. That's not a real picture. But what I'm saying is, if we had a picture on the desktop in the same folder as this project, we just type the name of the picture. And that would work. If there was a picture on the internet, we type the address to that picture. And I've got a picture for you. We're going to copy and paste it, so uh, I'm going to delete that. Let's go back to Firefox. Go back to your web browser. This is one of my websites. Let's go to vmcink.net. There's a picture of me there. We're going to borrow that picture. V -M -C -I -N -K dot net. So in Firefox here, I can uh, borrow the address to a picture by right-clicking it. So go to my website, and then go to the bottom right. You can see a picture of me right there. Right-click my picture, and you should have the option that says Copy Image Location, which basically means this is the address to that picture, and that's what we will paste into the source of our image tag. If you're using Chrome, it might say something else. Copy image URL, maybe? If you're using Internet Explorer, it might say something else. Every browser might say something else, but right-click my picture and select to copy the address or location or URL. And then back in Notepad, that's what you're going to paste into the source in the quotes. Because I wasn't going to have you type this. HTTP VMC Inc dot net slash assets slash images slash new slash vm campus dash instagram underscore 2529 dash 72 dot jpeg we could have chose save the image as and pasted it into our desktops yeah and then we did that yes but you would need to know that the name of your image what the name of the image was
can, can you also, in the, if you're just going to specify like a picture that JPEG, can you, can you put like C colon backslash and go to a different folder? Yes, definitely. Okay. So if you know the full path of your picture, you need to type the full path of your picture. And then it always has to be there. <laughs> yes. All right, so save it and run it. There I am. All right, so the image tag. It does not need a pair, but it needs the parameter, that whole source. We'll do one more thing and then we'll take a break. We've added some text, which were paragraphs, headings. We've added this dividing line, a graphical element, HR. Uh, we added an image from an online resource. Uh, let's add the HT in HTML, hypertext, a link to something. Under my, under my name, under the paragraph here, let's make a new paragraph. So add a new paragraph under my paragraph of my name, and we'll write um, visit VMC Inc. In a moment, we're going to make that an active hyperlink, a link. We're going to make it so that when you click on that, it goes to my website. Now, it would make sense to write the link tag, but actually the link tag does not delineate links. It delineates something else. We need a different tag that when this stuff was being invented, when Tim Berners-Lee was up all night inventing uh, HTML, he said, let me use this tag. This is, this is text, and this text will help me jump from this document to that document. This anchor will take me from here to there. So he thought, well, we'll add instead the anchor tag, which is the A tag. This one does need a pair, because we need to mark it. From here to here is a link. Now again, it's not the link tag, it's the A tag, A for anchor. This is an anchor. You click it, and it'll go to my website. The A tag. Hypertext. Well, like the image tag earlier, it didn't know what image we wanted until we gave it a source. Here, we need to do something very similar. We need to tell it what uh, link are we referring to. So go back to the, the starting H tag and add a space after the A within the tag. Make sure you've got a space in the tag. And here's where we will write href, hypertext reference. This is the website in question. Equals, quote, end quote. And then in here we type any web valid web address. And it needs the HTTP part. HTTP colon, what was the name of my website again? vmcinc.net. So within the quotes, type my address, check your spelling, save it, and run it, and see how you've made a hypertext reference, a link. Now you do need to type this properly, you do need the HTTP part or else it won't work because we need to specifically say this is a reference, this is a link to a website. 
And even though we maybe don't type it anymore on the web browsers because they're pretty smart now, we do need to be explicit and type this HTTP protocol in our link. We don't really need the WW part. We need the HTTP part. Save it, run it. There's what I've got so far. It's blue, it's underlined, just like way back in 1989 when this was invented. This is the default color, blue text and underlined. You put your mouse over it, you get the familiar hand, you click it, it linked you to my website. Press back, it goes back to this website. <coughs> we'll do two little tricks and then we'll take a break, <coughs> which is right now if you put your mouse over it. Have you seen examples when you put your mouse over a link that a little pop-up happens? A little pop-up appears that tells you where you're going? Let's do that. We're going to continue to add here to the A tag. We're going to continue to add another uh, property here. A tag, href, here's where we're going. Let's add another property. So after the href property, after the quote, but still within the tag, space. And we'll write title equals quote, end quote. And whatever we write within these uh, quotes is what will appear in the little pop-up. You can write whatever you want. Here's what I've written. I've added the title tag equals quote, end quote. You can write what you want here. This is a human readable code. Notice a lot of what we've written is machine readable code. These tags, some of the content is human readable. This is human readable. Save it and run it. And what you should see is, when you hover your mouse over it, it'll pop up. Check out Victor's site. And that's the code that does it, the title tag. Not the title tag, sorry. The title property of the A tag. Um, they're probably not interchangeable, but attribute is actually the more correct term. But they're interchangeable terms, property, attribute, uh, parameter, but I think attribute is the most official term. So attribute. We added the title attribute. We also had the href attribute. And you see what that does is you get a little pop-up. The last um, property that I'll add here is uh, I want, you've probably seen this behavior where you click on a link and it goes to someone else's website but in a new window or a new tab. The reason for this is let's say someone visits this website, they go to my website, they browse my website, and then they close the tab, they lost everything. They lost the website they came from. So I want this new website to appear in its own window, its own tab. So we'll add another attribute here. Title, we'll add a new one. This one is target. Target equals quote, end quote. And what we write in the quotes is underscore blank. I'm 
underscore blank. What that does now is it uh, made your, your link, it gave it the behavior that when you uh, click the link, the, the content that you're about to load will load in a different target, in a blank window. Now nowadays our web browsers, because they've got tabs, this usually means it'll open in a tab. To actually make a pop-up window that's in a different way, that would be through JavaScript, which we'll get to later. But at this point, at least what would happen is if you save this and run it, you click it opens a new content, but notice up here on my web browser, it opened in a new tab. There's the website I came from, there's the new website. The point of this is someone could then browse this site, be done with it, close the tab, they're still back on my original site. Question? You were quicker on the draw. Okay, uh, so how do I make sure that uh, the focus doesn't shift to the new? Well, uh, that actually goes against user expectation, because if a person clicks and it's and it and it's going to open a new window, that's what we would expect. Now, if you don't want that to happen, we can do that via JavaScript to make the window appear behind the other window and such. But that's messing with people's expectations. So what you could do to let people know that you're about to open a new window is add that to your title attribute. Check out Victor's site and whatever thing you want to say here. You can do something like this. Opens new window. What that does is if someone hovers over it, they'll see opens new window. It won't actually do anything really, but it'll give the user the knowledge that they're about to open a new window. So you really don't want to open a window without a person's knowledge. That goes against a lot of usability practices. Uh, so you want to let them know what's about to happen. Question? There's a, there's a setting in your browser, I think, that says open links in new windows. Does this somehow conflict with that? Well, it depends on the web browser. Oh. Some web browsers have an option to block pop-ups or new windows, and some browsers allow a new uh, a, a target blank to open a new window and some to keep it in a tab. We don't have much control about that. It's however the person sets up their web browser. Well, what I was thinking was, I, I thought Internet Explorer had a thing that said, said open, that forces all new links to open in a new window. It could. So even if you don't use the target underscore blank, it's still going to open in a new window. Yeah, and we don't have any control over that, and and I think that's pretty messy because every link that someone's going to click on, you're going to get twenty tabs, right. or windows. But uh, there's a there's a limit to how much we can control. The user themselves has the is the final arbiter. You know, we could design our whole site with CSS and make it perfect, but a person could define their own CSS and make the background always black for their eyesight, for example, and we don't have control over that. And that's something we have to live with as web designers. All right, so this is our document so far. It's looking pretty good. Uh, we've got the structural tags so far. We've got some of our content. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to start to style this. We're going to add some CSS so that it doesn't look boring, black and white. It's 8.20. Let's take one more 10-minute break. We're back at 8.30, and we'll start talking about CSS.